Praise God. Praise God. Welcome to the online church, everybody. Those of you who are live with us and those of you who are uh, listening to the recording. Many people listen to the recordings and God blesses them. Um, the recordings are, are going worldwide, not only throughout this nation, but worldwide as people are growing in the Word of God. People are discovering that we preach the Word of God. We preach what God's Word says, not what man thinks. And this is helpful to a lot of people. Uh, the Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so we give a shout out to you pastors out there who are listening to our recordings, and we pray that you'll use these recordings, uh, that you'll be blessed and that your congregation will be blessed, your ministry will be blessed, and if we can help you in any way, we'll be glad to do so. Praise God. And we thank all of you for our faithful uh, followers, Ryan Trugler, uh, Melanie Bias, Dustina Branham, Jackie Fisher, so many others, so many that we, uh, if I start calling names, are going to mess up. LaFrance Johnson and Lisa Johnson, and Gene Bratton, <coughs> my son Wes. There are many who come on live with us. We give a shout out to Christy Carpenter and Aaron Carpenter in Kuna, Idaho. Christy now uh, teaches Sunday school, and I, I love the way many of you are going back to the brick and mortar church to be of assistance there. And that's what our thrust, that's what our emphasis is going to be this year as we continue on the online church. We're we're believing that people will go back into their um, brick and mortar church or local church and help out with the ministry there <clears throat> and then Melanie by September by September Ryan we're going to um, start uh, transfer the uh, online church from the 11 o'clock a.m. hour to the 7 o'clock p.m. hour so that people uh, will have ministered in their local churches and uh, at 7 o'clock p.m. we'll be ministering to uh, members of the body of Christ, to pastors, teachers, prophets, apostles, missionaries, to build them up. After a hard day's work for the Lord, they need to be built up. So uh, starting in September, the online church will be online at 7 o'clock p.m. instead of 11 o'clock a.m. With the emphasis on going back into the brick and mortar church in the morning and working, finding Asking the pastor, Pastor, what, what place do you have for me in this service? How can I help build up the believers in this service? Praise God. I know it's going to be a change for a lot of you, but that's the direction the Lord is leading us in. Praise God. That means I'll be going back to uh, an online church, a uh, brick-and-mortar church to serve there, too. And uh, I'm not going to ask you to do what I'm not willing to do. Praise God. So I'll probably be uh, returning to assist the pastor at Shy Temple down in, Temp in, in Atlanta. And uh, they're ministering in the evening to build up the saints. Ryan Trugler, come on and greet us now. I think you're over the technical difficulties. Come on and give us a greeting and then lead us in prayer. Would you please? We're waiting on Ryan. We're trying to get Ryan in. Um, we don't hear him, so let's move on, move on. Hey, Melanie, would you please kindly lead us in prayer this morning? Melanie Bias? Sure. Uh, let us pray. Lord, thank you for this day. It's a beautiful morning, and we appreciate that you woke us up today. Uh, we thank you for the pastors, for the online church, and help to continue to bless all of us and especially our leadership so that it becomes a blessing to ourselves and to you. Um, we look forward to a wonderful message. We know you have one uh, planned for us that will bless our spirits and um, help us to have a wonderful week. Uh, look over us as we um, make our way through the trials of this world, which is in so, so much turmoil these days, but we know through our faith 
that you are in control and you have everything planned out as it should be according to your will. Uh, We thank you and expect a beautiful day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Melanie. Thank you. We appreciate your prayer. And um, we thank you, Lord, for hearing (coughs) Melanie's prayer. Praise God. Well, ladies and gentlemen, according to the uh, calendar, February is Black History Month. And um, we celebrate Black History Month. And um, I hope you do, too. And as a Black History Month special, As a Black History Month special for any of you who do not have a copy of my book, Black Heroes of the Bible, the new edition, and that's about 320 pages, Black Heroes of the Bible, the new edition, Uh, I'd like to offer you a copy of it for free. Just contact me via the website or via email or text. give me a text message, 404-205-11. Zero one. I'd like to give you a free copy of this book. Now, it's free for any donation. Now, you say, well, that's like buying the book. It's free for any donation. Any donation. If you only have a dollar, if that's all you got, then send, send me a dollar and we'll send you a book. Praise God. Uh, I'd like to make a, I have about a hundred copies in reserve and um, the, uh, p- the b- books that were published last year, and I've got about a hundred copies, and I want to make sure the body of Christ gets this book. So, uh, this book is free. This book is free for any donation to the ministry, and uh, you can go on our website and make your donation, or you can contact me and make your donation. Then I will send you a copy of Black Heroes of the Bible, the new edition. This book has twenty-one people in the Bible who were black and their stories. They were not all heroes, even though the book is entitled Black Heroes of the Bible. All were not heroes. Some were villains. Some were villains. Okay? And uh, I'm talking about uh, Nimrod and a couple others. They were villains. But it's a great book and it's good for your Bible study. It's good. It's biblically sound, well-researched. And I thank God for blessing me to write this book. Okay, praise God. Well, today we want to take a look at a uh, powerful message. We started last week in the, uh, with the subject, Whose Report Will You Believe? Whose Report Will You Believe? And we looked at um, a, a powerful message from Isaiah, Isaiah 53. One, and so uh, I want to ask you to turn to Isaiah 53.1 or download Isaiah 53.1. And while you're doing it, that, uh, we want to uh, just ask um, Kevin Wilson to come and sing another song. Kevin has given us permission to play his songs. We do not own the rights to these songs, but he's given us permission. So you're going to hear another song from Kevin Wilson, and we're going to look at a song called Don't sweat the small stuff. Don't sweat the small stuff. Kevin Wilson. Thought 
thoughts of giving up will run through my head. This old man that I know walks up to me, puts his arm around me, and he says, Son, I've been down. Wasn't that long ago? If I learned anything, if you gotta get back on the road, don't sweat the small stuff. Well, time I don't know. But everything has a way of working out. It won't take too long if you just hold on. Be strong when times get tough. When things in life don't work out like you planned, just keep the faith and trust your fellow man. Don't sweat the small stuff, but time and a little love. Everything has a way of working out. I like that. I like that. I like that. When things get rough and when uh, times get tough, be strong. Be strong. Don't sweat the small stuff. And I like the way Kevin sings. And Kevin sings, he, his uh, uh, sentences end with a question mark. Instead of don't sweat the small stuff, he said, don't sweat the small stuff. I like that. I like that. One of these days, I'm going to learn, Ryan, I'm going to learn how to sing country uh, one of these days. But in the meantime, we got Kevin Wilson, and Kevin is a great friend of ours. We love you, Kevin. Thank God for you. And you keep on letting the Lord use you. Kevin is from uh, Kentucky and doing a great job for the Lord wherever he goes. Praise God. I met him in Indianapolis, uh, Indiana, last year. Great man of God. Great man of God. Okay, okay. We hope Ryan Trogler is on with us and hope he's cleared up his uh, uh, technical difficulties. Ryan is a very important part of this ministry, and we thank God for him. I thank God for you. Praise God. Let's get ready for some word. Let's take a look at Isaiah 53. And um, we don't have Jackie Fisher on to read for us today. And Jackie's uh, working back with the uh, Rick and Mortar Church. And so is Dustina. I like that. I like that. You, Many of you have been following this ministry, ministry for a couple of years. And now you're going back where you're needed. And you're going to help build up those ministries uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. I like that. I like that. So continue what you're doing. Praise God. Um, I don't see several people in the chat window or in the um, uh, attendees list. I think some people are waiting for until the time I, I get off President Trump's back. Okay, so I'll probably be off, off President Trump's back after next week, after the vote is over. Uh, but next week, I'm telling you right now, uh, our message is going to be a comparison of trials. You need to tell everybody you know to come online with us next week. Melanie, my subject is going to be a comparison of trials. We're going to look at the, the trials of two kings and what was the result of those trials. Two kings, Melanie. You got to be here, Melanie, next week. Ryan, you got to be here next week. Folks, you got to be here next week. Uh, international community, make sure you get the 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 the, the recording next week, we're going to look at two trials, the trials of two kings. We're going to compare those trials, and then uh, uh, we'll see what God does with that. 
Praise God. Praise God. A lot of people don't like the online churches these days because cause we're calling this calling it the way it is. We're telling it like it is. A lot of folks don't like you messing with their politics. A lot of folks don't uh, like it when you make them think. Christians don't want to think. Christians are reactionaries. Most Christians I know are not thinkers. They are reactionaries. Ryan, they go whichever way the wind blows. Uh, most Christians I know go whichever way their pastor leads them. And if the pastor ain't preaching holiness and righteousness, what is, what is, what's that saying about the body of Christ? Well, anyway, let's take, a, let's take a look. Isaiah had that same issue, ladies and gentlemen. Isaiah had that same issue. He said in the word in chapter 53, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. That's what Isaiah has written uh, in this 53rd chapter. He is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. And we esteemed him not. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Isaiah said, we didn't want him. We didn't even want to look at him. We, we hid our faces from him. We esteemed him not. We did, did not give him respect. Who's Isaiah talking about? Verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet, we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Then Isaiah says in that sixth verse of the 53rd chapter, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah reveals to us what we learn or what we are learning in our study of the book of Judges. Every man did what was right in his own sight. Every person is doing what's right in their own sight. And Isaiah says, all we like sheep have done that. We've gone astray. We have turned everyone unto his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Imagine, ladies and gentlemen, everybody in the world, all these billions of people doing their own thing, going their own way, doing whatever they want to do. But the Lord God Almighty has laid on Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, the iniquity of us all. That is why, because of that, everybody ought to be worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody ought to be worshiping him in truth and in holiness and in righteousness. Everybody ought to take time out to worship the Lord. Everybody, it's time to turn that uh, TV off, time to put that uh, drink down, try, time to stop counting that money, stop trying to, uh, uh, time to stop the amusement, the entertainment. I know it's Super Bowl game day, but there is a time that we ought to honor the Lord Jesus Christ because God has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Imagine all the billions of people who have walked on this planet earth and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and God laid on Jesus the iniquities of every one of us. Jesus, the Bible says he was bruised for our iniquities. He was wounded for our transgressions. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. So why can't we worship him in spirit and in truth? I'm going to ask you a question, some questions today, some serious questions, because a lot of you say you're believers, you're Christians, you're Christians. It's easy in America to say, I'm a Christian. Uh, uh, it's easy for Americans to say, I was born in a Christian nation. It's easy to say, uh, I'm a Christian. I'm, I, 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 I go to church. But ladies and gentlemen, how many real Christians are there in this nation? 
How many real Christians are there in your nation? How many real Christians are there in Israel? What about Kenya? What about Russia? What about England? What about Canada? What about Germany? What about France? What about China? What about Afghanistan? How many people are really bona fide Christians? I mean followers of Jesus Christ. And we've got millions of people in this nation, ladies and gentlemen, who claim to be Christians but are not living Christ-like lives. Uh-oh, uh-oh, so there you go, Pastor Carter, meddling. You're always meddling. Hey, I'm a preacher. What well, unto me if I don't preach the gospel? The, the Bible says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. The Bible teaches us to follow after righteousness and holiness. The Bible says holiness without which we cannot even see God. And so we praise God. And I thank God for the boldness. I thank your Holy Spirit for the boldness to preach the gospel. Thank you for counting me worthy of this calling. I thank you, Lord, that you have men and women throughout this nation and the nations who are not afraid to preach the gospel. And, Lord, my heart grieves. My heart cries out for those many men and women who call themselves preachers, who are pastors. They're leading congregations. And they are afraid to preach your word. They are afraid to take a stand against unholiness. They are afraid to take a stand against unrighteousness. They are afraid of retaliation. They are afraid of, of what people will think. They are afraid of the political system. Lord, raise up prophets, teachers, pastors, apostles, evangelists, missionaries, raise up the body of Christ and fill with your Holy Spirit that we will stand and having done all to stand. Help us to be like uh, we're told in Ephesians chapter uh, 6, that having done all to stand and then help us to put on the whole armor of God that we can stand against all the wiles of the devil. Lord, I pray that no longer will preachers compromise the gospel. I pray that no longer will Christians no longer uh, 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 be afraid of the gospel. Lord, I know even in this ministry, Lord, uh, some people have drifted away because we are challenging them to stand for holiness and 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 some are they would rather stand for their culture they 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 they're american christians they're american christians their culture is american christianity in other words in other words american christianity means that uh, they follow the american way oh my great 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 grandfather fought with daniel boone and uh, and helped pave uh through the wilderness of Kentucky and Tennessee with Daniel Boone. My great-great-great-grandfather uh, uh, traveled with Davy Crockett. We helped pave the wilderness, and we had services every Sunday morning under the trees, and we read uh, the Bible, and we're American Christians. Yes, and, and then they, uh, after they read the Bible, they went out and slaughtered Indians. They scalped Indians. Well, my great-great-grandfather, uh, he went... He had services. He built churches in, 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 in uh, Georgia. Yeah, but your great-grandfather built churches, and he owned uh, hundreds of slaves and, 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 and dehumanized hundreds of slaves. My great-great-grandfather rode with uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest. I know I'm, I'm going to bring some history out in there. My great-great-grandfather rode with Nathan Bedford Forrest. He was there when he organized the Ku Klux Klan. I have a, a, a replica of his robe uh, in, in my archives. Yeah, and, and, and all the people your great-great-grandfather burned and burned crosses in their yards, then hung them uh, uh, on trees and their, burned their bodies, but yet you're an American Christian. Ladies and gentlemen, it takes more than being an American Christian because we have made a game out of Christianity in America. Come on now, I know I'm telling the truth. We have made a game out of Christianity. We think that because we go to the church on Sunday and we vote a certain way and we're politically correct with our community that we can continue to live any way we can. Well, the Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray. And we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid the iniquity of all of us on him. Thank God for that. But God expects a response. God respects 
holiness. God expects us to cease from sins. God expects somebody in, in, in our families to say, okay, the buck stops here. That My, my grandfather made uh, moonshine. He, he got rich selling moonshine. Well, my great-great-grandfather uh, made a, a, a lot of money uh, trafficking human flesh. Or, or my granddaddy did this. Uh, there's a time when you've got to say, hey, look, I am not going to be a part of this. Because that is not American Christianity. Well, they built churches, and they fed the hungry, and, and they provided jobs for a lot of people. Ladies and gentlemen, the buck stops here. When you know that you know that you know that you know that you had a thug in your family, a no count, a no good, a, a racist, a, a hater, why do you continue to perpetuate that person's legacy when you know it's a lie? And that brings us down to the current age, ladies and gentlemen. The current age. Uh, this puzzles me. This puzzle, and perhaps it will puzzle you. Why do Christians continue to believe and follow a liar? Tell me. I wish some of my regular attendees were on so I can get their answers, but a lot of them chose not to come on today because they knew what direction I'm, I was coming in. Uh, uh, why do Christians continue to believe and follow a liar when they know that the liar is not speaking or living the word of God? Why? Come on, some, somebody in America, give me a phone call today. Somebody send me a text message. Somebody send me an email and answer why American Christians continue to support a liar when they know he's a liar, when they know he's uh, not telling the truth, when they know he's a racist, when they know he's a hate monger, when they know he's a deceiver, when they know he's a whoremonger, when they know he's a sex trafficker, when they know he's a racist, yet Christians, American Christians support this man, follow this man, and will go down the, the tube with this man. Why? Why? When, when the... The, we call ourselves Christians, and Christianity is built on the faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, listen to me, listen to me. Jesus Christ was not a whoremonger. Jesus Christ was not a racist. Jesus Christ was not a liar. Jesus Christ did not uh, send tweets out every day lying on people. Jesus Christ had the courage and the boldness to stand in the face of the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees, and he told them eye to eye, eyeball to eyeball, face to face. He said, you are whitewashed sepulchers. You're a generation of vipers. You are liars. You are adulterers. He told them to their face, ladies and gentlemen, and he stood for righteousness. Jesus Christ was not an alcoholic. He was not a drug user. He was not a, 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 a he was not demon possessed. He he was not a uh, 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 like our leaders today. Jesus Christ had guts. He had courage. He was a man. He did not uh, say something behind closed doors and do the opposite in the public. Jesus Christ had the courage to stand up for righteousness and holiness, yet it cost him his life. Isaiah said he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Ladies and gentlemen, somebody answer this. This puzzles me. Why do Christians continue to believe and follow a liar? Pastor, why you continue to follow a liar? Why you continue to urge your congregation to follow a liar? Tell me, Pastor so-and-so. I'm not going to call your name. I called your name out last week. And there are other pastors I should add to that list. Why do you continue to preach what you call the Word of God and yet tell your people to follow a liar. If you're going to preach Jesus Christ, that means you believe in Jesus Christ, everything he said and everything he did, but yet you are standing up and standing before a congregation and leading a congregation to follow after a liar, 
a deceiver or whoremonger, someone who is exactly the opposite of Jesus Christ. This puzzles me. It puzzles me. If I had hair, I'd scratch it out. It puzzles me. Why do Christians continue to believe and follow a liar when they know that the liar is not speaking or living the word of God? I know I'll get a whole lot of people unfriending me after this message, but that's all right. I'm going to keep on preaching the gospel. Somebody's going to listen. Somebody's life is going to be changed. Praise God. Somebody's going to get the courage to stand up for righteousness and holiness. Psalm 40, verse 4. Psalm 40, verse 4. David writes this. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust. And respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. My subject today is, whose report will you believe? Part two, whose report will you believe? Will you believe the report of the Lord? Or are you going to believe the report of those who are standing in these pulpits, these wimps, I call them punks in the pulpit, who are after political gain, who are after financial gain, who who, who are out to please the people who are scared for their jobs. They don't want to lose their jobs, so they don't preach against the ungodliness in our government. They're afraid to take a stand against ungodliness because they don't want to grieve the people and lose their perks and lose their position. Yes, yes, there are many out there who are just like that. I pray that you're not like that, listener. Psalm 44 says, Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust. Not a lying leader, not a lying politician. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Blessed is that man who makes Jesus Christ his trust. Not a political party. Ladies and gentlemen, there are people in America who put political party above Jesus Christ. They, and they go to church every Sunday. Many are preaching the gospel. Many are leaders in their churches. They have put politics, political party, above Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, that is called idolatry. It's called idolatry. America is practicing a form of idolatry. And God is not pleased. God is not pleased. Oh, you might win some elections. You might even get a position. You might even get some perks. But ladies and gentlemen, God is going to move. He is, I guarantee you, in the name of Jesus, God is going to move. When I look at the Bible and the history of the Word of God, I see that on many occasions, God moved. God will give you enough rope to hang yourself. But God is holy. He's righteous. He will not forget. He, he, will, he will judge. And God is going to judge America. He's going to judge a lot of you pastors. He's going to judge a lot of you preachers. He's going to judge a lot of you Christians. He's going to judge me. He's going to wonder uh, if I stood on the word of God. Did I just preach it and not live it? Or did I live it also? I intend to live the word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, God is calling for men and women who will take a stand and stand on holiness. Stand on on righteousness. Don't be a Christian on Sunday and a whoremonger on Tuesday. Don't be a Christian on Sunday and a liar on Wednesday. Don't be a Christian on on Sunday and then vote against righteousness on Thursday. Don't be a Christian on Sunday and then uh, 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 do your dirt on Friday. Be steadfast, unmovable, the Bible says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. The Bible says they will know we are Christians by our love. You say, well, I love, I love the leaders of this nation. I love the leaders of this nation. Yes, that's your problem. You love them. You, idol, I, I, you idolize them. You put them above Jesus. You say you love God. We made a vow to God. We made a covenant with God that we will follow Jesus. We made a vow before God that we would follow Jesus. But many people have backslidden. Many people have uh, put Jesus on the side. They put Jesus on the shelf. Now, Jesus, you stay here. You stay here on the shelf, Lord Jesus. 
because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to worship President Donald Trump right now. He's my leader. And 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 uh, I know he's a liar. I know he's a whoremonger. I know he's a deceiver. I know he's a a quid pro quoer. I know he's a racist. But I'm gonna worship him because that's the that's the way the culture is going. That's where the that's where the wave is going. That's the flow. So Jesus, you stay on your shelf. I know I'm talking to somebody, and I know I'm preaching the truth. Jesus, you stay on the shelf. And, and I'll come back to you when I need you. But right now, right now, Donald Trump, he the man. He be the man. He's the man. He's, his crest is, is, is riding. His, his star is rising. Ladies and gentlemen, it looks to me like the real colors of the church are truly showing. Come on, somebody. It's look like, it looks like the church flag is really uh, waving. It's red, white, and blue. It's red, white, and blue. Uh, and it looks like to me that everyone who calls himself a Christian ain't one. Where are the followers of Jesus? Where are the holy people in this nation? Who is standing for Jesus in this nation? Where are the righteous? That's, those are just some of my questions. Where are the self-deniers? Jesus said, if any man will follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. If any man will follow me, Jesus said, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous, but call, come to call sinners to repentance to repentance. Here we have our situation, ladies and gentlemen. We have a person in the highest office of the land who thinks he's greater than God. He does not need to repent. Why should he apologize? Why should he repent? The church backs him up. The pastors back him up. He can, he can uh, spew out race, racist hatred. He can uh, spew out hatred against the Mexicans and the Central Americans. He can uh, spew out racism against uh, blacks and the poor and uh, 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 the downtrodden, but he's got the support of the church. He's got the support of the pastors. He thinks he's above the law. And what's this saying to you pastors? What's this saying to you Christians? I know it's tight, but it's right. Ladies and gentlemen, you better take Jesus off the shelf and put him back on the throne where he belongs and take this man off the throne and put him on the shelf where he belongs. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you about a man named Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Some of you pastors out there are like Humpty Dumpty. Some of you Christians are like Humpty Dumpty. You know the truth, but you refuse to walk in it because it's not popular. Some of you are afraid to walk in the truth, and some of you are just plain puffed up. Nobody can teach you anything. There are so many Christians who are, you, some of the hardest people to teach anything to today is are Christians. They know everything. They don't have a teachable spirit. Nobody can teach them anything. They do whatever they want to do. Just like Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Ladies and gentlemen, many people are walking on dangerous ground today. Many are practicing idolatry. God is not pleased. God is not pleased. Ladies and gentlemen, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All of the king's horses. All the king's men couldn't patch him up and put him back together again. Well, what's that mean? How, what do you mean? What's that got to do with the Bible? Turn with me to Daniel chapter 4. I'm glad you asked that question. In the next couple of minutes, Melanie, we're going to look at Daniel chapter 4. We're going to look at Humpty Dumpty. We're going to look at what happened to him. All right, now. Chapter 4 of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, the king unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, 
peace be multiplied unto you. This is Nebuchadnezzar's own testimony, ladies and gentlemen, as recorded by Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar said, I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. This is his personal testimony. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is everlasting kingdom, an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Nebuchadnezzar in the fourth verse says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Nebuchadnezzar said, I had a dream, and it troubled my head. Now this is the most powerful king in the world, ladies and gentlemen. I had a dream that troubled my head. Verse 7, then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. Uh, and I told the dream before them, but they did not know, did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar called in, uh, called in all of his uh, 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 Republican senators and governors and leaders. He called in his pastors. He called in uh, Pastor So and So, Pastor So and So, and Prophet So and So, and told them his dream, but they could not tell him the meaning of his dream. Verse 8, but at last, at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy God, and before him I told the dream. Nebuchadnezzar said, I called all my, all my Republican advisors and counselors. I called in all of those who uh, 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 voted to uh, cast out all the evidence in my trial. He said, I, I called them all in, and I called in all their friends and the millionaires, and I called in all my preachers, all those flunkies who are in, in my pocket, all those who I pay off, all those who are afraid to preach the gospel. I called them in to share my dream, but they couldn't tell me the dream. But then I called Daniel. I called Daniel the one we named Belteshazzar after our God here, but he's got the spirit of the living God in him. I called him, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubles, troubleth thee. Tell me the visions of my dream that I've seen and the interpretation thereof. Thus were the visions of mine head in my bed. Here's what Nebuchadnezzar said, verse 10. I saw, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. The beast of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher, meaning an angel, and holy one, came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree, cut the tree down, and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, and scatter his fruit. Let the beast get away from under it, and the fowl from his branches. Nevertheless, Leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field. And let it be wet with the dew of the earth, and let his portion be with the beast in the grass of the earth. Verse 16, let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. In other words, let him be like this for seven years. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand of the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know, listen to this, that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basis of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now, 
Thou, O Belteshazzar, meaning Daniel, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my political party, of my kingdom, are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able, for the spirit of the holy God is in thee. Nebuchadnezzar said, all the preachers whom I paid, all the preachers, preachers whom I paid to, uh, to promote my political agenda, all the pastors whom I paid off, all the pastors who are sitting pretty in their pulpits because uh, they support my agenda, all the pastors who know that I'm a liar, who know that I'm a whoremonger, who know that I'm no good, who know that I'm a racist, yet they love me because I'm the greatest thing ever happened to America. Uh, 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 Nebuchadnezzar is saying uh, they can't help me, but I know that you can, Daniel. Then Daniel, verse 19 was astonished for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. Daniel was shaken for an hour. He knew. He knew the interpretation of the dream. Okay? He said, My Lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. Then verse 20, The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto the earth, unto the heaven and the sight thereof to all the earth, that tree that you saw, Nebuchadnezzar, whose leaves were fair and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, etc. Verse 22, that tree is thou, O king, thou art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reaches unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. And then Daniel tells him, whereas the king saw an angel and a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, cut the tree down, destroy it, leave the stump, etc. Let, uh, uh, let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beasts of the field for seven years. This is the interpretation, O king. And this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king. Verse 25 that they shall drive, listen to this, ladies and gentlemen, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven years shall pass over thee, that thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee, after that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness. God gave Nebuchadnezzar an opportunity. Break off your sins by righteousness. Repent, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. Tranquility. If you break off your sins, if you repent, if you turn now, you will lengthen your tranquility. Verse 28 of chapter 4 of Daniel, all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, see, God's got his timing, ladies and gentlemen. You see, some of you are out there riding high right now. You're politically correct. You know you're following a thug, a no good, a no count, a whoremonger, a liar, a racist, a deceiver. Americans, you know many of you are following a no good leader, but yet you still support him. And you'll kill to keep him in office. And you're hating one another because you're following this leader, because you think you're going to benefit by following him. At the end of 12 months, see, God's got his timing, ladies and gentlemen. At the end of 12 months, Nebuchadnezzar walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Nebuchadnezzar said, Look at this great kingdom I have built. From myself, by myself. While the word, verse 31, listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. 
and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven years shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Verse 33, the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what happened to the mighty king Nebuchadnezzar. He became a madman. They put a chain around him, a collar around his neck. He ran on all fours for seven years through the forest and the wilderness. He ran like a wild animal. His hair became feathers. His nails became claws. It's written, it's substantiated by the historical record. When you look at world history outside of the Bible, it substantiated that Nebuchadnezzar went crazy and lived like a mad animal in the wilderness for seven years. Why? Because he defied the Most High God. And ladies and gentlemen, many people went down the tube with him. But look at verse 34. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted, mine, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised him and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Drop down to 36. At the same time, my reason returned to me. I got back my right mind. And for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me. They reinstated me as king. And my counselors and my Lord sought after me, sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. He said, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, verse 37, this is the king that destroyed Jerusalem years before. This is the wicked king who thought he was God. Verse 37, And I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride, listen to this, those that walk in pride, he is able to humble. Nebuchadnezzar said, I walked in pride. I was puffed up. I lied. I was a whore monger. I was a whore monger. I was a racist. I was a deceiver. Those who walk in pride will be humbled, he said. Ladies and gentlemen, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty back together again. Hallelujah. God had mercy on Nebuchadnezzar after seven years of living like a madman, after seven years having a collar around his neck, after seven years having his hair turned to feathers, after seven years of having his nails turned into claws, after seven years of eating grass like an animal, his reason returned to him. God had mercy on him and restored him. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put him back together again. God putting back together again. And when you check out history, ladies and gentlemen, when you do a study on Nebuchadnezzar, you will see that after he lived as a madman for seven years as an animal. He was restored, and he lived one more year after being restored to be the king of Babylon. He lived one more year, and God blessed Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 37, he said, I praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. And it's told that Nebuchadnezzar sent out decrees throughout the then known world, 
for everybody to worship the Lord God Almighty. Ladies and gentlemen, do not idolize anyone. And don't support people who are ungodly. Why would you preach and teach and lead God's people to destruction when you know that God is a holy God and you know what he requires of us? God said, I've told you, oh man, what is required of you, but to do just, just, justly, love mercy, and walk humbly before me. Why, America, do you persist in spitting in God's face and making God a mockery and, and promoting your own kind of godliness and choosing leaders that are ungodly and supporting them and deceiving the very people who have elected you in the office, and yet you sit up in church every Sunday looking holy, looking holy, and promoting a form of religion that's a disgrace to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's time to repent. I know this message is going to rub a lot of people the wrong way. I pray that it will separate your bone from your marrow, your soul from your spirit, and that you'll call upon the mighty name of Jesus and repent. And I'm going to be the first to repent. Father God, in the name of Jesus, forgive me of my sins and forgive our nation of our sins. Forgive the nations of our sins. We have sinned against you. We have all sinned against you. We've all gone astray and gone our own way. Father God, return us to the shepherd and bishop of our souls. We repent, Lord. Have mercy on us. Save the unsaved. Restore the backslidden. Recover the, those that were lost. And Father, help us to live in holiness. And help us to uh, take Jesus off the shelf and put him back on the throne. And to worship him in the beauty of holiness. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. Praise God. Praise God. We're going to end our recording. But I pray that those of you who have questions and comments, get in touch with me. Get in touch with me. I'll be glad to talk with you, have prayer with you, and share with you.